is there anything that you can do infinity times? Or I guess a better question is, is there any event in the universe that can happen infinity times? I can name at least one. These magnets clacking together. Although the noise might seem never-ending to someone within hearing range of a kid who got their hands on these, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not telling a joke. What I mean is that each time you throw this buzzing magnetic toy in the air, the magnets bounce off of each other an infinite amount of times. Now, admittedly, this is more of a mathematical thing than a physical thing. In reality, the number of bounces is just shy of infinity. But it's still a fun thought. This is only one of the many interesting discoveries that I made on my quest to calculate the sound of these magnets. In this video, I'm going to walk you through a physics problem that I recently asked myself. What is the frequency of the sound that these magnets make? Then, we're going to analyze the audio to see if our predictions work experimentally. Between 1750 and 1785, a couple of physicists independently discovered acute law about magnets. The attraction between two magnetic poles is proportional to 1 over the distance squared. If you've done a bit of physics, this should look familiar. It looks like Coulomb's law of the force between two charges, and it also looks like gravity. In fact, this doesn't just look like Coulomb's law, it technically is Coulomb's law. One of those physicists that made this discovery was Coulomb. But unlike charges or mass, magnetic poles can't be separated. If you cut a magnet in half, each one just gets a new pole. So the force between two ferromagnets is a little more complicated than this. It depends on the geometry of the magnet, but still, this is a decent approximation. If you hold one of these magnets up to a compass, you can see that the poles are along the short axis. That's why they always end up together like this and not like this. I said earlier that this approximation of the magnetic force is very similar to gravity, but when you're doing physics on Earth, you usually don't use this equation. Instead of saying that gravity is proportional to 1 over distance squared, we usually say that the force is constant. A falling object accelerates at 9.8 meters per second squared. This is valid because most objects are falling on such a tiny scale in comparison to the radius of the Earth. Some of you aren't going to like this, but I'm going to make the same approximation with these magnets. Pretend the force, and therefore the acceleration, is constant. Now, of course, this isn't true. You can feel it in your hands. When magnets are far away, they're weakly attracted. When they're close, they're strongly attracted. But think about the problem we're working on. When these magnets are making that noise, they're going to be bouncing off of each other maybe a few millimeters at most. When you move from here to here, the difference in force is really not that noticeable. So even though this isn't correct, I think you're going to be surprised how well it does at predicting the sound, and it makes our math a lot easier. Once the two magnets are attracted to each other and collide, they bounce away and start getting pulled together again. If the total kinetic energy is conserved when two bodies collide, we call that collision elastic. This is often what physics classes will focus on because they're a bit easier, but in reality, energy is almost always lost in a collision, whether it's through heat, sound, or something else. We know that our magnet's collision is inelastic because we can hear it. Sound takes energy, and that has to come from somewhere. To model our inelastic collision, we'll use the coefficient of restitution, basically how bouncy something is. Our object will enter the collision with some speed and leave with another speed, so the COR represents the fraction of speed that we kept. Something like a pillow might have a COR near zero, while something like tungsten carbide might have a COR near one. Judging by how many times the magnets are able to bounce, I would guess that theirs is pretty high, maybe around 0 0.9. If our experiment works, we should be able to figure it out with only a recording of the sound. Let's start by calculating how long the magnets will be in the air between collisions. Because of my convenient choice of magnetic force, this is exactly the same as the classic first-year physics problem. You throw a ball in the air with speed v, how long is it in the air? And the answer, however you might do it, is 2v over g, or for our magnets, 2mv over k. Now, using our coefficient of restitution e, the velocity of a bounce is e times the velocity of the previous bounce. That also means that the airtime of the magnets at any bounce is e times the airtime of the previous bounce. T of 1 will be e times t of 0, t of 2 will be e times e times t of 0, t of 3 will be e times e times e times t of 0, and you can see that in general t of n equals t of 0 times e to the n. 
So we went from an equation in terms of the previous bounce to an equation in terms of the first bounce. Why do we care about how long the magnets go without colliding? Well, sound is mechanical vibration, and the pitch or frequency of sound is how many times per second it vibrates. If we know the period between collisions, we'd just take the inverse of that to get the frequency of the sound that the magnets make. This equation that we just found gives us the frequency of the magnet noise after the nth bounce. But bounces aren't a very good measure of time because they get faster and faster as the magnets lose kinetic energy. So we need to convert bounces to seconds. Here's how we do that. The total amount of time that's passed is simply the sum of all the times that each bounce took. We can take out the initial period, and then we get this term of e to the 0 plus e to the 1 plus e to the 2 all the way to e to the n. This is called a geometric series. You might be familiar with, or at least thought about, the case where e equals 1 half and n equals infinity. This evaluates to 1 plus 1 half plus 1 quarter plus 1 eighth plus blah 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 all the way to infinity, and that all equals 2. As long as e is less than 1, which it should be unless we have a weird material that adds kinetic energy when it collides, our magnets will stop after a finite amount of time, and in that time, they should bounce an infinite amount of times. At least in math. In physics, that's just a silly way of saying that they stopped bouncing. What we're really interested in is when n is a finite number. To solve this, you can multiply our series by e, then subtract that from the original. Everything cancels out except the very first and last terms, so you can rearrange and see that the time that has passed by the nth bounce is 1 minus e to the power of n plus 1, all divided by 1 minus e. Solve this for n, then plug it back into our equation for the period at the nth bounce. Now you have the period after t seconds. Take the inverse of this whole thing, and you have your answer. This equation tells us the frequency of the magnets as time goes on. Let's see if it makes any sense. Here I plotted our equation, and you can see that as time goes on, the frequency gets higher. It's the shape of the note, right? If the magnets are not very bouncy, or if E is close to zero, then the note will end sooner. If the magnets are perfectly bouncy and E equals one, the frequency stays the same forever. That's exactly what we expect. If the initial frequency is lower, or in other words, if you held your magnets farther apart when you threw them, then the plot starts lower and takes longer to end. This all checks out, so all that's left is to look at the actual sound from the magnets and see if it fits. But how do we see sound? The short time Fourier transform is a method for turning a signal in time into a signal in time and frequency. If you watched my video on popcorn, you might remember that scientists were able to detect gravitational waves using the wavelet transform, and the STFT is very similar to that. It's built into just about any audio editing software, and it's available for your favorite programming language. You can read it kind of like sheet music. The color of each pixel represents how much of that frequency was present in the recording at that time. Here's a good recording of the magnets in a typical plot of amplitude. And here's what the spectrogram looks like. You can see that the recording starts with these vertical lines. They correspond to the first few hits of the magnets, the reason they're vertical instead of the slow curve that we expect is because the STFT uses a set window for each time step, then it finds the frequencies during that short period. At the beginning of the recording, the frequency is so low that the window isn't big enough to catch it, so we only see one hit. We could lengthen the window, but that would also make it lower resolution, so it's a compromise we have to make. Once the sound gets a little higher, we start seeing the curve appear. The curve is definitely getting higher, but the funny thing is that there are a lot of lines here. They seem to all have the same general shape, but they're at different frequencies. The lowest curve is the one that we solved for, while these higher ones are harmonics. At least, that's what my guess is by looking at it. Because our sound definitely isn't a pure sine wave, it'll contain multiple frequencies all at integer multiples of each other. So the fundamental is the one we calculated, then to get these we use 2f, 3f, 4f, and so on. But until we plot our equation on top of this picture, this is all just a guess. Let's try it. I made two sliders to control the curve, one for the starting frequency and one for the coefficient of restitution. 
If our math and all of the many approximations that I made are correct, we should be able to make these curves fit over the audio. Hey, I think that looks pretty good. The shape is spot on. The harmonics even fit too. I think our prediction was right. If we look at the value of E, you can see that it actually makes sense. 0.96 is a pretty reasonable number for a hard metal like these magnets. I predicted that it would be close to 1. The initial frequency also makes sense, but there are quite a few other variables wrapped up in it. Remember, it depends on the magnet's strength, the mass, the distance that you held them apart when you threw them, but since we made so many approximations, it would be hard to calculate those. I don't think this is really meant to be a method for measuring the properties of these magnets, so I would call our experiment a success.